Hello and welcome back everybody. Maybe my favorite day of the entire semester. The title of this section is called Matrix Functions. This is actually something I didn't encounter until I was a graduate student. It's a really fascinating piece of mathematics and actually incredibly relevant to quantum mechanics, certainly to solving any sort of linear differential equations. These are very, very important. And the idea here is that we are going to formalize the idea of considering f. So if you start with f as a function, maybe from the complex numbers to the complex numbers, as now a function from a space of matrices to a space of matrices. Let's call this matrices to matrices. Maybe I'll go ahead and make those look like they're actually vector spaces. So the vector space of matrices to the vector space of matrices. Um, and basically, the idea is that we, we use the, the first function from complex numbers to give us the function on matrices. Now, how do we do this? We get away with it because of diagonalization. We saw back with polynomials. So let's recall with polynomials that uh, a polynomial of a diagonal matrix, and actually I'll write it as diag of some entries, lambda 1, lambda 2, dot, 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 lambda n, because you can think about those lambdas as the eigenvalues, certainly when it is a diagonal matrix, these are definitely the eigenvalues. So you can take a polynomial of a diagonal matrix, and it, it, it behaves this freshman's dream idea where you just exchange the order of the diag with the polynomial, and you can just apply it to each of the eigenvalues individually. So our new eigenvalues of whatever this new matrix are, the image under the polynomial of the old eigenvalues. That's actually called something really special. The fact that we're mapping the eigenvalues to the polynomial of the eigenvalues is known as the spectral mapping theorem. Not that we're going to focus too much on the spectral mapping theorem today, but it is actually a really important theorem in the study of differential equations. But you have this notion of being able to just pass the polynomial through the diagonal to each of the entries along the diagonal. Let's go back to Taylor series as well. Recall Taylor series, and I know it's been quite some time for the Taylor series. But the Taylor series says that we can represent any function, which is analytic. OK, so there's a specific name for these functions. They're called analytic. But we can represent a good variety of functions as the following. The nth derivative at x0, x minus x0 to the nth power divided by n factorial, and starting at 0 and ending at infinity, or maybe if we let x not be 0, we can just do the nth derivative at 0, and then all we have is x to the nth power divided by n factorial. So I'll say or when x0 is 0, and you get the latter case. And what's going on here is this is really just an infinite polynomial. You know, if I made that infinity in the top of the sum some finite number, I'm really just writing a polynomial out. And then I'm taking kind of a limit of polynomials to arrive at f. And so combining these two ideas, we have that any function of a diagonal matrix, lambda 1, lambda 2, dot, 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 lambda n, can pass over to the entries of the diagonal. And you end up with exactly the diagonal of f of lambda 1, f of lambda 2, dot, 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 f of lambda n. So we're just evaluating f along the diagonals. Now, I could have listed this as its own definition of a matrix function, but it's only a matrix function on diagonal matrices. So I guess the important thing and the important theorem for today, theorem and definition, is we're going to suppose the matrix M is diagonalizable such that M equals X D X inverse, where, as always, the columns are eigenvectors and the diagonal entries. <coughs> 
our eigenvalues. That's everything we've been covering in the last two videos. And then we can define f, so that's a function from the complex numbers to the complex numbers, as a function on m as f of m is equal to x f on the diagonal matrix times x inverse, where f on the diagonal is f on the diagonal, lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on to lambda n is the diagonal of f on lambda 1, f on lambda 2, f on lambda n. So this has some really important consequences. The primary consequence Or, and there's really two of them, is that when f of x is 1 divided by x, or equivalently, 1 divided by x is just x inverse, we recover that f of a matrix equals the inverse matrix. And we can say that the inverse matrix then is x, f of the diagonal, x inverse, which is x, and then the diagonal inverse x inverse. And the diagonal inverse is really easy to calculate. It's just the diagonal of 1 divided by lambda 1, 1 divided by lambda 2, dot dot dot, 1 divided by lambda n. So this makes your life really easy in finding inverses. And then the next primary consequence is the one from, that'll really show up when we encounter ordinary differential equations. We'll say, I'll use the function g, which is parameterized by time and then as a function of x, and I'll call this e to the tx, the exponential of something parameterized by time. Or parameterized over time. And we have g parameterized by time of a matrix m is equal to e to the tm. But what is that equal? It can be calculated, right? This latter term means we can calculate it as e to the t diagonal x inverse, where e to the t diagonal is just the diagonal of e to the t lambda 1, e to the t lambda 2, and so on, e to the t lambda n. So this is a way of us calculating this object e to the tm, which is going to be incredibly important for differential equations. And let's just add a little bit of a teasing to you right now, the solution to the Schrodinger equation. Let's recall this i h bar d dt, and then we've got psi here equals h hat psi with initial quantum state psi of zero is e to the t h hat divided by i h bar. Don't worry too much about the divided by i h bar there. And then that acts on our initial state. And so because what we constructed, this is a, a matrix function, the title of this section, a matrix function evolving over time. And because it's a matrix function, it actually is a matrix and it's able to interact with this as a fixed vector. And so in reality, solutions to, to quantum systems are really their operators or their matrices evolving over time, and they just propagate the initial condition, which is that fixed vector. But we'll see that in the future. We're not going to focus too much uh, on that being important for today. We'll, we'll focus on it a lot more in a later video. So with that said, all we're going to do now is perform some examples. So let's go ahead and use matrix functions to invert the matrix 0, 1, negative 1, 0, and also compute e to the tm, which would be e to the t, 0, negative 1, or sorry, 0, 1, negative 1, 0. So let's compute those two. 
in both cases, I mean, at any time we use matrix functions, we must diagonalize M, which means we have to find its eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And we're just going to go back. This is the matrix from the previous video. So we'll go ahead and recall that the diagonalization here, x, d, x inverse, looked like 1, i, i, 1. And then we had eigenvalues of i and negative i. And then we had a 1 half, 1 minus i minus i and 1. And so now let's recall, let's just scroll up and look at our two matrix functions, kind of the ones we care about. What we do to invert a matrix function is we go ahead and just invert the diagonal, right? So we're taking 1 divided by each of the eigenvalues, or 1 divided by each of the values on the diagonal. So that means all we're doing for m inverse is we're grabbing the diagonal and we're inverting the diagonal which means we're grabbing the diagonal and we're inverting that. So we're taking one divided by each entry, one divided by each diagonal entry. So we can think about one divided by i is the same as negative i. I stress that periodically. And then one divided by negative i is the same as positive i. Now I could have written it. Maybe I'll just write that over here. One divided by i is negative i. And one divided by negative i is i. And so that just makes my life a little bit easier. The x's just come along for the ride, right? So x comes down. It doesn't change when I take a matrix function. And same over here for x inverse. I still have 1 half, 1, minus i, minus i, and 1. And let's go ahead and see if this gives me m inverse. So let's go ahead and compute by actually performing the multiplications here. So I'll do that first multiplication first. So I'm looking at all columns on the right and all rows on the left. And I guess my matrix is going to be the top row by the left column is going to be minus i plus 0. The top row against the second column is going to be 0 plus i squared. The bottom row by the first column is going to be negative i squared plus 0. And the bottom row by the second column is going to be 0 plus i. And that's going to still multiply the second matrix, one half, or I guess the third matrix, 1 half, 1, negative i, negative i, and 1. And I can go ahead and simplify the matrix on the left there to be minus i, a positive i squared, so negative 1. Negative i squared is a positive 1, and then an i in the bottom right. This is going to multiply 1, negative i, negative i, and 1. And if I go ahead and look at all rows on the left, all columns on the right, what am I left with? In the top left, it looks like I've got a negative i plus i. In the top right, it looks like I've got negative, negative i squared. Two negatives are canceling. And then minus 1. Bottom left, I have 1, then I have minus i squared, and then on the bottom right, I have negative i plus i. And then a 1 half coming along for the ride. Looks like what am I left with? 1 half on the matrix 0, negative 2, 2, and 0. So if I pass the 1 half in everywhere, I get 0, negative 1, 1, 0. So my matrix function is telling me that this should be the inverse of m. So this should be the inverse of that matrix. Let's go ahead and check. This is basically me trading every negative sign for each other. Let's go ahead and check m against m inverse. m was 0, 1, negative 1, 0. I claim this is m inverse, 0, negative 1, 1, 0. Let's go ahead and multiply those rows, columns. What am I left with? I'm left with on the top left, I'm left with a 1. On the top right, I'm left with a 0. Bottom left, I'm left with a 0. And bottom right, I'm left with negative 1 squared, also known as 1. And here's my identity matrix, and so that definitely worked as an inverse. So let's move on to doing the e to the tm. We'll do the matrix exponential here. That's the name that we give this, by the way. e to the tm is called the matrix exponential. Let's compute it here. So e to the t. 0, 1, negative 1, 0. As always, it's just x e to the t diagonal x inverse, where the diagonal here was i, 0, 0, minus i. And every time I take a function of a diagonal, I'm just taking the entire function and applying it to both diagonal terms. So that gives me x, and then the matrix e to the i t 
0, 0, e to the minus i t, and then x inverse. And let's go ahead and rewrite what x and x inverse were when we calculated those, really from the previous video, but I can just steal them from above. x was 1 i i 1, so we have 1 i i 1, and then e to the diagonal is e to the i t, 0, 0, e to the minus i t, and then x inverse was 1 half, 1, negative i, negative i, 1, and we have to go through our lovely procedure of two rounds of matrix multiplication yet again. So the first round of matrix multiplication, all rows against all columns, we're going to end up with the first row on the left column gives me e to the i t. The first row on the right column gives me i e to the minus i t. The second row on the first column gives me i e to the positive i t. And the bottom row on the second column gives me e to the minus i t. This multiplies the 1 half, 1, negative i, negative i, 1. And I'm going to perform my matrix multiplication one more time. All rows, all columns. So I have a 1 half, and then my top row against my left column gives me e to the i t. And then I have minus i squared. i squared is negative 1, so that gives me a plus e to the minus i t. My top row against my second column gives me negative i e to the i t. And then I have plus 1 copy of i e to the minus i t. On the bottom left, I'm ending up with 1 copy of i e to the i t. And then I'm ending up with a negative copy of i e to the minus i t. And then finally, on the bottom right, I have negative i squared, which is positive 1 e to the i t plus e to the minus i t. Now this looks a little bit ugly. I can go ahead and pull the 1 half to each of the four interior terms if I want to. Let's do it, and then I'm going to tell you how to simplify this, because it's probably not clear how one should simplify it in its current form. So this latter term, I'm going to still write it as minus i e to the i t plus i e to the minus i t all over 2. I'm going to do the same on the bottom, i to the e to the i t minus i e to the minus i t all over 2. Finally, e to the i t plus e to the minus i t all over 2. Now, when you've been around the block the way I have, these are actually screaming at me. I wouldn't expect any of them to scream at you right now. Let's go back to Euler's formula. This really is our best friend a lot of the times when we're dealing with complex exponentials because it says e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. And it has consequences that cosine of theta is e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta over 2, as well as sine theta is e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta over 2i. So these are the consequences. And in fact, this term is exactly what's showing up here and here, except I'm replacing theta with t. Now you might expect the sine terms to show up too, but let's comment that there's an i in the denominator there, and for some reason we've put i's in the numerators up here, so let's go ahead and bring i into the denominator at the expense of a minus sign. And the minus sign that we are at the expense of is because of 1 divided by i is negative i. So what we end up with in the top right, there was a minus i in front of the first e, and a plus i in front of the second one. So at the expense of a minus sign, we get a minus there, and vice versa in the other case, we get a minus here and a plus here, or if I want to be a little bit even more clever, I can put a minus in front of everything and write a minus right there. And so what we end up with in terms of the sign is that and that. And so in reality, what we've ended up with here is cosine of t, sine of t, negative sine of t, and cosine of t. And if you recall from the previous from the previous situation, the matrix we started with, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, was rotation by negative 90 degrees, or negative pi over 2. What we've computed here, actually, this matrix exponential is a rotation by negative t degrees. So this one here, cosine t, sine t, negative sine t, cosine t, is rotation by negative t degrees, not technically negative t radians. So it's rotation by negative t radians. So there's a there's a way of just, uh, basically you can think about this, this matrix exponential as kind of the continuous analog, this parameterization by t is the continuous analog of the, the quarter term rotation.
Now that's going to make a lot more sense as you just kind of continue in your mathematical maturity. You'll kind of figure out why this, this feels natural, but it's really cool just to see in this case anyway. Let's go from scratch. Let's just do one more example and compute e to the tm for the matrix m being 1, 2, negative 2, 1. And our first step will be to diagonalize this. And so to do that, we have to find all eigenvalues and all eigenvectors. So eigenvalues will come from the determinant of 1 minus lambda 2, negative 2, and 1 minus lambda, which is going to give me 1 minus lambda squared. Minus 2 times negative 2 will be plus 4. If I FOIL out 1 minus lambda squared, I get 1 minus 2 lambda plus lambda squared plus 4. And so I'm left with lambda squared minus 2 lambda plus 5 is 0. And we can find that lambda is negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac is going to be minus 20. All over 2, we have 2 plus or minus the square root of negative 16 all over 2. Well, 16 has a square root. The square root of 16 is 4 with a negative sign. The price I pay is an i because i is the square root of negative 1. And so the negative sign, I pay the price of i, then I have i times the square root of 16, which is 4, all divided by 2. Or in other words, lambda is going to be, if I distribute the 2 uh, in the denominator to both the 2 and the 4 in the numerator, I have 1 plus or minus two copies of i. So I could write this as 1 plus 2i and 1 minus 2i. So those are my eigenvalues. And at this stage, I can compute the eigenvectors. So let's look at the first case is going to be 1 minus, let's just choose, you know, when lambda is 1 plus 2i, it's going to be 1 minus 1 plus 2i, 2, 2, well, negative 2 over here, and 1 minus 1 plus 2i against x1, x2 needs to be equal to 0, 0. And this is going to give me the system of equations. Well, I can simplify what's at top here. That's a negative 2i. And what's in the bottom here is also a negative 2i. And so my system of equations in the x's will be negative 2i x1 plus 2x2 is 0, and negative 2x1 minus 2i x2 is 0. And I can go ahead and solve the first one. Let's go ahead and solve it for x2. I'm going to bring 2i x1 to the right-hand side and divide by 2. I have that x2 is i times x1. There's my relationship. And this gives me that x corresponding to lambda being 1 plus 2i is x1, x2. But I know x2 in terms of x1, I have x1 and i copies of x1. And if I want to let x1 be equal to 1, I certainly can. I end up with 1 and i. So that's my first eigenvector. My second eigenvector corresponding to lambda is 1 minus 2i. I can write out as, well, this was this will be 1 minus 1 minus 2i. And if I simplify that, that will simplify to a positive 2i and then 2, negative 2, and this will simplify to a positive 2i as well, against x1, x2 is equal to 0, 0. That's going to send me to the system of equations 2i times x1 plus x2 is 0, and negative 2x1 plus 2i x2 is 0. If I solve the bottom case for x1, I end up with x1. I'm going to bring 2x1 to the right and divide by 2. I see that x1 is i copies of x2. So that's my relationship. And so my vector corresponding to 1 minus 2i is the vector x1, x2. But I know x1 in terms of x2, it's i copies of x2. And I can go ahead and let x2 be equal to 1 to give me the vector i1. Therefore, I'm finished with eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And I can go ahead and diagonalize. Because diagonalization is produced and say that m, which in this case, you'll recall, was 1, 2, negative 2, 1, is equal to x, d, x inverse, which is equal to x being my two eigenvectors, 1, i, i, 1, against d, which has eigenvalues. My eigenvalues were 1 plus 2i and 1 minus 2i. And then x inverse, I'm going to have to invert that matrix when I do, it's 1 divided by AD is 1 minus BC is minus I squared. I squared is negative 1. 1 minus negative 1 is 2. 
and then I'm going to swap A and D and make B and C negative. So this is the diagonalization of my original matrix. And then in step two, I can compute E to the TM, which is not too bad because it's going to be X E to the T on the diagonal, X inverse. And because I just computed my diagonal, I have it right here. I'm going to take the exponential of both of those. E to the T one plus two I, zero, zero, E to the T one minus two I. And then I have X inverse one half one, negative I, negative I, and one. And now I can go ahead and actually perform the matrix multiplications to find out what E to the TM is. So under my matrix multiplications, I'm going to consider all rows on the left, all columns on the right, and I'm left with one times E to the T one plus two I. Then I have a uh, one plus I times zero and E to the so I have I copies of E to the T one minus two I. On the bottom row in the left column, I have I copies of E to the T one plus two I. And on the bottom right, I have one copy of E to the T one minus two I. This multiplies X inverse, which is one half one, negative I, negative I one. And I can look at all rows and all columns. And I can go ahead and compute. My top row against my left column is gonna give me e to the t one plus two i, and then that's going to be minus i squared, also known as plus one, e to the t one minus two i. I will also have the top row on the right column is gonna give me minus i, e to the t one plus two i, and then plus i, e to the t one minus two i. And then my bottom left is going to give me i, e to the t one plus two i, and then I'm going to subtract the i on the bottom right term, e to the t, 1 minus 2i. And then finally, my bottom row against my right column gives me negative i squared as a positive 1, e to the t, 1 plus 2i, and then plus e to the t, 1 minus 2i. So this is the solution. And in fact, the one I would expect from you. However, it does simplify with Euler's formula. So let's go ahead and use Euler's formula. Oh, I guess there's a one half that's sitting around, right? Simplifies with Euler's formula. And I won't go through all of the work on how this simplifies with Euler's formula, but more or less you can think every term has e to the t in it, every single term, right? Because that real, real power, e to the t times one, every term has e to the t times one. So I'm just gonna pull that out. And I'm gonna pass the one half to the inside. And what you'll see if I pass the one half to the inside, you'll see these sines and cosines exist, but now their frequency has a two instead of just a T on it. So there's a T on the sines and cosines, or a two on the sines and cosines. We end up with cosine of two T. We end up with sine of two T. We end up with minus sine of two T. And we end up with co cosine of two T. So I don't necessarily expect you to be able to arrive at this solution but I think if you were a graduate student and you know actually performing a research project with the quantum mechanics, and this was kind of the matrix that you had to use in your quantum mechanics, uh, then you would probably be expected to, to end up with the solution. So better solution, but not necessary. I'm not gonna be a stickler to make sure that you can arrive at this later solution with Euler's formula, but this one does give you, it really does simplify quite nicely to something that you can understand. Anyway, we're gonna stop there for the day. It's been a lot of fun. See you in the next one, bye.